Let's go ahead and open up the Word. We're going to spend some time reading in 1 Peter chapter 4. And uh, if you don't have a Bible and you'd like one, just raise your hand and we'll get one to you. We've been in this series together called Dual Citizens, where we've been studying through the book of 1 Peter. And uh, I wanted to get some feedback here for just a minute. Um, what have you been thinking about and learning and wrestling with as we have been reading through 1 Peter and talking about this concept of having a dual citizenship, living both in the world and also in the kingdom of God? I'm going to have you guys catch or pass this microphone and just share a little bit about how have you been processing and what have you been learning. Thank you. Just raise your hand and Mickey will bring it over to you. First one's always the hardest to break the ice. Do it like a bouquet and just throw it up. Ice. Right, right, yeah. You could just do like the bouquet throw. See whose head it hits. Okay. Whoa. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I absolutely love um, First Peter um, verse 6. You rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials. So the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, through or though perishable, is refined by fire. And y'all, trials are not fun. <laughs> I don't know anybody who loves trials and is like, yay, suffering. But <laughs> um, at the end of the day, like God is changing my heart to rejoice in my trials and not only rejoice but thank him for my trials because it's refining my faith and um it's somewhere in the old testament but it talks about how the fire is in the crucible is for like silver and gold and at the end of the day it's like god's perfecting us through those trials and it's not fun in the moment but it's like his service to us ironically mm. right. how many of you guys like going through suffering trials yeah, that would be all of us. We're going to talk about that some more in chapter 4. Who else? Thank you so much for sharing. Yes, ma'am. Well, um, my husband and I have had a lot of conversations this past week about um, being submissive and respectful for each other. Mm. And, um, yeah, they got a little, they've gotten a little lively. I'm quite... Um, I, I have a little issue with that sometimes, so um, just learning to um, really understand each other, and I really love the message about subversive submission, mm. and uh, I, mean, I think I said that right. I'm yeah, that's right. But, um, and how we're equal, even though we still have to submit to each other. Right. Yeah, so if you weren't here last week, I was able to start off the sermon with the first verse of chapter 3, Wives, Submit to Your Husbands, which of course is one of the most popular verses in the 21st century, and so uh, hopefully we all found that very edifying. Uh, let's come over here. Yeah, so that section, um, I feel like that passage is often a very manipulative passage. Mm. Um, and obviously, I'm speaking like from a man's perspective. I don't understand the other perspective. But like I've even felt that. Mm. Um, and I think what was cool when we talked about, it takes a lot of trust and value to submit to God and not value the other things that bring attention from the citizens of this world. Um, giving way to fear is adorning yourself with the world and the culture. And so I think that passage it really talks a lot about the culture, perhaps what we value, perhaps how we've even looked at marriage, you know, while living here. But God's like, wait a minute, y'all, you're missing it, and we're going deeper. And so I, I appreciate that. Obviously, yeah. there's a lot there. Yeah. Dual citizenry even affects our marriage. Anyone else? Maybe one more or so. Last one over here. Thank you. Some of you guys might be coming to church going, wow, like, we get to talk? <laughs> and then you get frozen by it. Like, wait, I don't know what to say. <laughs> um, yeah, so what I've been learning <clears throat> is uh, a lot about love. So right at the end of 1 Peter 1, 
Um, it says, now that you've been purified, or now that you've purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. Um, and just how different, like, God's love looks versus, like, like the, the way I was raised with my family and that type of love. And then um, just, like, seeing and realizing just how much God loves me and, like, how much more so I need to love other people in that same way. Mm. Amen. So I'm going to invite Daniela up, and we're going to read 1 Peter chapter 4 together. And then we're just going to work our way through it, and I'm going to make a few comments and uh, hopefully draw out a few themes here in 1 Peter 4 as we consider what it looks like to live as dual citizens. Amen. Okay. Thank you. This is 1 Peter chapter 4 in the New International Version. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind, so that you may pray. Above all else, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. That girl can read. <laughs> All right, so a couple of things that I want to highlight as we work through this passage. The very first thing is this therefore, right? And we're going to see three, I think, main themes in this chapter, just like we kind of drew out three main themes from the previous chapter. And this is the beginning of the therefore, we now are done with sin. Now, what do we do when we're done with sin? And then he continues at the end about godly suffering, which, of course, everybody loves. 
Everybody loves suffering, right? How many of you feel like you have undergone some suffering recently? Suffering is such a common human experience, right? And the scriptures actually have a lot to say about suffering. In the beginning here of this passage, we have this therefore, which of course we need to go back up into the previous chapter to see what he's talking about, in particular, verses 12 through 22. As he's talking about the death and atoning sacrifice of Jesus, he says, since Christ suffered in his body, he says to arm yourselves with the same attitude. What attitude? The one who considered it joy for the cross set before him. Oh boy, this is like what she was sharing, right? About trying to find joy in suffering is such a paradox. It's so otherworldly and non-human, and yet this is what it looks like to live as dual citizens. One of the primary markers of being a dual citizen, meaning a person of the kingdom of God while residing on earth, is how we suffer. It's one of the ways that differentiates and reveals that we are not only citizens of this world, but citizens of a heavenly kingdom. It has to do with how we suffer, our attitude in our suffering. And guess what? It takes arming, practice, intentionality. He says that whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. And because we're done with sin, we do not live the rest of our earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather the will of God. And then he goes on to elaborate what kind of earthly desires, evil human desires, do we tend to live for? He says debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing. Oh, there's an old English word. Anybody use the word carousing in their day-to-day -day language? Yeah, me neither. You have to go look it up to even know what it means. It means like wild partying. It's, it's quite synonymous with wild living. And he says detestable idolatry. Idolatry is the worship of things other than the true God. So he says that when we're done with sin and we arm ourselves with this same attitude, then we actually begin to, instead of living for these evil human desires, we actually live for the will of God. And he contrasts these evil human desires with the will of God in the next couple of verses. So the evil human desires are these things, right? But then... He's going to continue on in the next passage to talk about what's the will of God. But I want to park here for a minute. There's two things that I want to highlight. One, when we no longer live for evil human desires that are made up of these things, guess what happens? You suffer. Because these people, who's they? It's the pagans, right? Right? The people who are not dual citizens. Pagan is not a pejorative word in the Bible. It just means those that represent the people who are not in the kingdom of God. And he says that those people are actually surprised by the way that you're living for the will of God. And that you don't join them in the things he just mentioned. And guess what they do? They heap abuse on you. Anybody ever had abuse heaped on them for trying to live righteously? Why do we do that? Well, I think one of the reasons is because we're often quietly indicted and convicted. When someone is living righteously and we see that, it automatically compares and contrasts our unrighteousness. And we don't like that. So we heap abuse. I was talking with a young man recently. He said to his mom, Mom, I'm trying to make changes in my life. I'm trying to live for God. I'm trying not to get high anymore. I really need to make this change and that change. And she said, okay, great, son. And that night he comes home and she says, hey, son, by the way, I know you're trying to live righteously, so don't worry about that weed I just put out on the table. 
Thanks a lot, Mom. And there are all kinds of examples of this where we're trying to live righteously, and yet, in the middle of doing so, we suffer at the hands of people that we even love and care about. Why? Because they're surprised that we're not living like they are. He says, but they will have to give an account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, which again refers back to the earlier chapter that we talked about last week, the strange three options that we have about the angels and where Jesus was and preaching in the time of Moses and all that, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. What does this all mean? In the first century, most people believed that once you die, you're beyond the judgment of the gods. That you're trying to appease the gods through ritual sacrifice and worship and all kinds of things so that they can make your life here and now better. They believe, though, that once you die, the gods can't touch you because you're in this different state and realm that they don't exist. Peter here is saying that's not the case. Peter says that God is the God of the living and the dead. In other words, you can't escape God's judgment just because you die. How do you think that was received by his audience? They will have to give account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. We cannot escape God's judgment just because we stop living on this earth. And for those that believe that they are dual citizens, that informs how they choose to live now because they believe that God's judgment is real and will come. And so what we believe about the future actually impacts what we choose to do now. And this is what this whole next section is about. And I love that idea. What we believe about the future determines how we live today. I was just talking to someone in the fellowship break. They were planning on adopting. They had this plan and this future idea. We have two of our own children. We're done having our own children. We want to adopt. What a great, noble, and honorable, godly thing to love the orphans, the widows, and those marginalized around us. And then, all of a sudden, they got pregnant. What they believed about the future determined what they were doing. And then all of a sudden, the plans change. And they're like, I think we're going to adopt later. (laughs) What we believe about God's future judgment impacts the choices that we make today. The type of life that we try to live and why. And so as we continue on in verse Seven, he says, the end of all things is near, and this is what we believe about the future. The end of all things is near, that we are living in the last times. And the last times have nothing to do with the political arena, have nothing to do with what nations are going to war with other nations. The last time has to do with the fact that Jesus has risen from the dead and empowered his people with his spirit, and he says, I'm coming back to consummate all things, to renew all things. In between his resurrection and the consummation of all things is the last times, and that's where we are. The last times isn't about trying to read signs and decrypt numbers and codes. The last times is that we're living in an age where we are in between the already and not yet. We're already in a time of the resurrection of Christ and his powerful spirit living in us, and yet we are bound to this earthly body and our sinful natures and the wars and the politics and the nations warring against one another. We're still in this mixed time. That's the end times. The only time left after that is when everything is made new. And this is what Peter is calling to his audience's mind, that the end, the consummation, the renewal is near. That was written 2,000 years ago. 
To us, that feels like a long time. But we also know that from God's perspective, it's very different. We see in the scriptures that poetic metaphor of a thousand years is like a day to the Lord and a day like a thousand years. That God operates outside of the construct of time as we know it. And so we have to be alert and sober so that we can pray. And he says, above all, love each other deeply. This is what undergirds the entire microchurch thing, is that we can learn how to love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. He says, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Anybody who offered hospitality with some grumbling? <laughs> Can't believe the mess they made. We got to make what kind of dessert? You know, like they parked where, you know, get off of my grass, you know, whatever. We are hospitable with some grumbling. I love how he slides that in there. Be hospitable without grumbling. I have to be hospitable while also arranging parking because my driveway is so tight and small. <laughs> I'm like, no, no, don't park over there. We got, you know, I got to like run signs and have lights. And We've been talking about, as a microchurch network, this idea of hospitality. Making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything, Matthew 28 is something that we take serious as followers of Jesus. But for so many of us in our cultural context, we have been taught either explicitly or implicitly that making disciples is about bringing them to a church service or that making disciples is about getting them to say a prayer or that making disciples is about a transaction of their sins being forgiven. Making disciples is all of those things and so much more. And so for us as a microchurch network, we're trying to learn how to be hospitable. How do we actually try to share our faith to expose this dual citizenship to others around us without this? Without saying, come to church with me. It can be very new and awkward and we're like, hey, come to my house with seven people that you don't know. And we're going to be doing some weird things like praying to an unseen God and reading a text that's thousands of years old and singing songs off key and off beat and you know like it's not super attractive right and so this is a paradigm shift for so many of us to know how do we make disciples without the current construct of church these guys had to engage in the same things these christians here in the first century they didn't have church buildings it wasn't a sanctified religion of the state as it would be 400 years later with the grand basilicas and temples. and These were just groups of people living in society, in their homes, in their workplaces, tradespeople trying to share about the end of all things being near. And people thought they were strange. And he says that as we're trying to be these dual citizens, as we're trying to be hospitable and love each other deeply, that we should use whatever gift you have received for what purpose? To serve others. Guess what we tend to use our gifts for in the other kingdom? Citizens that are not dual, we use our gifts for what? Self, right? To promote, glorify, prosper self, and maybe if we're quite noble, other people that we like. Everybody on my block eats. And no one gets that reference here, so I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm here, Lord. You have me where you have me. Okay. Um, I was also talking about Cali in L.A., so that was helpful. Appreciate that. All right. Whatever gift. Some of us have got gifts that you're like, what? I don't have any around on my block. What are you talking about? Okay, we use those gifts, though, to serve other people. And sometimes we can get jealous of each other's gifts, right? Like, I can't sing like Dela, you know, and I can't play 8,000 instruments like Mickey, you know. <laughs> I'm not stupid enough to get up there and say what John says. 
or whatever, right? He says that we should use whatever gift we've received. What does that assume? That everybody has received a gift or gifts. Part of our role in the kingdom of God is to help each other to believe that, to see that, and to practice that. And the more that we can get away from this dynamic, where most people are watching a few people's gifts, the more we'll be able to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in all of its various forms. There's all kinds of gifts, all kinds of passions, desires, and heart. And we want to help that to flourish so that others can be served. And he goes on and gives some examples of how that looks. If anyone speaks, to speak the very words of God. To serve, to do it with the strength that God provides. So that in all things, this is the why, the purpose, the end goal. This is the touchdown. So that God can be praised. It's not so that we can get praised. It's not that I'm serving others so that somehow I can be lifted up. You ever see when someone's like trying to encourage and lift up and honor someone else? Like, hey, I really wanted to share about this great thing. And like inside you're like, ooh, I hope it's me. Ooh, do they know about the thing that I did, you know? He says that's not what we do that for. We do it so that God can be praised, so that we look at each other and how we are living and go, praise God. You're doing that. You're serving that person. You're loving this person because of God, because God has inspired and gifted you to do that. Praise God, not praise each other in and of itself. So the last thing that I want to look at here is this idea of godly suffering and how we suffer really matters to God and also to the rest of the world that is not living as a dual citizen. He says, dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal. Of course, remember the context when we did the introduction to this book. Peter's audience are Christians who are starting to undergo persecutions. They're starting to undergo tensions with the state and the culture around them. And most scholars believe that not long after this was written, the persecution really intensified. And so these words would have been all the more apropos and needed when people begin to not only just be jeered at or socially ostracized, but their physical lives are threatened. Some hundred years later, they're actually burned on stakes to light Emperor Nero's courts. They're put on crosses to line roadways in Rome to show what Rome does to its enemies. And all of these people are taught how to endure suffering. He says, don't be surprised. You're not weird. If you're undergoing suffering because of your convictions about living righteously and following Jesus, you're not weird. Don't be surprised. It's not something strange. Instead, you should rejoice. Why? Because you are participating in Christ himself. And he says, so that you can be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. He says, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. What in the world? That is some crazy, paradoxic type of thing right there. If you are insulted... Because of Christ, then you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Did you know that persecution and insults because of Jesus actually affirms that God's spirit is in you? That God's spirit rests on you. And so that has to lead us to the question, right? When was the last time I was insulted or persecuted because I was following Jesus? If that's not happening, the natural question that Peter's begging here is, is God's spirit resting upon you? Now, of course, persecution and insult can happen for a number of reasons. And this takes a lot of a discernment because why? He says that if we suffer, 
If we undergo persecution, if we undergo jeering, it should not be because of our own idiocy. He says it shouldn't be because of our own unrighteousness, because we're a murderer or a thief or any kind of criminal or even a meddler. What's a meddler? Don't look too closely at somebody in the room now. I'm telling you, just uh, meddler. I know what a meddler is, John. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But seriously, though, right? We want to read this murderer, thief, criminal. Ah, check, check, check. Uh, you know, I made my parole, you know. I don't have any outstanding warrants. But he says, or even a meddler, right? That our suffering should not be at our own hands because we're living unrighteously. He says, if you're getting suffering, if you're enduring suffering and getting persecuted because you're on hands, well, you just get what you deserve. Of what credit to that is you? Or credit to you is that, right? He says, however, but if you're suffering as a Christian, meaning if you're suffering because you're actually doing what is right and righteous, don't be ashamed. That's easier said than done. Why? Because we care about what people think. We don't want to be insulted. We don't want to be thought of as strange and weird. We don't want to be thought of as aliens and citizens of another place. But he says, instead what we should do is praise God that you bear that name. If you are not being insulted or persecuted in any way because of your faith, you've got to ask some serious questions. If you are, you need to praise God. I don't know about you, I tend to not praise God. Now, I do have to, I do get, you know, in my, you know, I'm trying to calibrate, right? It's all perspective. In my world, I get insulted and persecuted a lot. As I, like, run that through the matrix of church history and what Christian, no, okay, I don't. But for me, it feels like a lot, okay? And I have to decide, or rather, I have to discern, is that insult, is that suffering actually because I'm following Jesus? Or is it because I'm just an idiot? It helps to have other people around you that can help you discern that. So that's another little freebie. If you don't have people around you that can help you go, hey, you're kind of being a jerk, you deserve that, get some. You can find him in a micro church. <laughs> he says the reason that we should praise God, that we bear that name, is because the time for judgment will begin with God's household. This is the narrative of the story arc of the Bible, that God judges the Israelites, his people. And then in Jesus, he invites all people to come. And then he says here in Peter that if God's judgment begins with us, What will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? In every culture, in every time period, in every civilization of human history, this will never be popular. We live in a society that's experimenting with pluralism unlike perhaps any civilization that has ever done before. And it's so attractive Because on the surface, what it tells us is that we can all get along. That none of us have to draw any lines or make any judgments or make anyone feel uncomfortable. It is so attractive, but what's the problem? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Just a pragmatist would say, it doesn't work. The Christian worldview says why it doesn't work. Because there is a judge, meaning there is a judgment of right and wrong. There is a judgment of morality and immorality, that all things are not equally true. And if that is the case, then that brings a division, a judgment, right? That will never be popular. And this is why we bear that name. Now, we don't need to run around being idiots and judging people improperly or eternally. None of us have that power. However, Jesus made some statements and said some things to people around him 
that made them feel certain things to the point where they killed him. People don't kill Mr. Rogers. Jesus is not Mr. Rogers. He did not make everyone feel good. He made some people feel amazing. And he made some people feel terrible. Why? Because he said, I'm a judge. He says, if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, then what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Those are strong words that should give us pause and sobriety and alertness of mind and heart to ask the questions that sometimes we don't want to ask of ourselves. Where am I at, God? Where am I with you? How will your judgment be with me? Don't avoid those questions. He says, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. My last remark that I want to make is that suffering is a part of the human experience. Suffering differentiates from the human experience in that we suffer for a reason, not at the result of our own idiocy and unrighteousness and outbursts of anger and hatred and jealousy and racism. That's not why we suffer. As Christians, we suffer because we believe in judgment. And when we believe in judgment, it affects how we live today, that we're willing to live righteously, not just to abstain from what is immoral, but to love even our enemies, even to the point of being willing to die for others at the hands of their hatred and say, as Jesus did, Father, forgive them. He says we should commit ourselves to our faithful creator. If you are receiving insults and persecutions, if you are receiving backlash from the world around you because of your faith in Jesus, he says, continue to do good. God's faithful. This is where our faith is tested, right? Do you believe in God's faithfulness to you? That death is not the final story. That though man can kill the body, they cannot destroy the soul. Jesus says, fear God, who can destroy both the body and the soul in hell. Don't fear man, who can only destroy the body. He says, this life, this earth, this existence, this citizenship is not all there is. Let us be faithful to our creator who is faithful. Join me in prayer.